Hello, it is my pleasure today to speak about the uh, messages from the most recent publications in the field of renal transplantation, October 2018 update. I reviewed more than 700 articles that were published this year, and I'm going to present the juice and the clear messages from them with following the, these corners. I'll start with introduction, followed by the value of antibody, antibody mediated rejection, and the biomarkers for rejection, what are the most updates in the hepatitis C virus infection and transplantation, medical complications after transplantations, using t cell therapy in renal transplantation, donor corner, and I'll end with miscellaneous issues. Regarding the, the first article, it is better to assess the patient need to replacement therapy, and if, he, if the patient is fat, and donor is available, please go ahead for transplantation without dialysis. Why? Because preemptive transplantation, preemptive kidney transplantation, uh, achieves the best graft outcome. And even doing dialysis for a short period of time, less than six months, was associated with increasing the hazards of graft failure. And the, the uh, prolonged dialysis, the more the time on dialysis, the prolonged dialysis duration, the more the worse is the outcome. Tacrolimus clearance, tacrol high, tacrol high clearance means that the patient needs large dose to achieve the same therapeutic level. So, and this study showed that high tacrolimus clearance is associated with interstitial fibrosis and tuber atrophy. This study included 500 patients uh, who were subjected to protocol biopsy after seven weeks and one year. So the message is we should be meticulous in monitoring tacrolimus. This is the one of the recent uh, randomized control trials in the field of transplantation, including more than 2,000 patients, de nouveau kidney transplant recipients, uh, assessing the issue of everolimus with reduced calcineurin inhibitors in transplantation. As you see, using everolimus with reduced calcineurin inhibitor here, they was not inferior to the uh, uh, mycophenolic acid uh, arm with even with better and lower incidence of infection, especially CMV and BK virus infection. However, there are uh, some un un uh, limitations for application of this study. However, it is a step forward uh, to encourage the use of virulomus in transplantation. If you go to the YouTube, you'll find some videos that I recorded early this year about immune suppression. Uh, uh, the uh, calcium inhibitors uh, and the immature inhibitors update, induction emittance of immune suppression, special situation, the mega trial and transplantation. Regarding the issue of protocol biopsy, I am totally convinced by protocol biopsy to follow patients because if when we see histologically changes, this is the uh, best evidence for changes. So this is a study addressed the issue of protocol biopsy in pediatric renal transplantation as a valuable tool. Here, the biopsy done within three, six months after transplantation, after a year of transplantation and five years, you can find here the histological changes uh, for each biopsy done. And the most important is uh, the uh, biopsy here, biopsies here can uh, lead to change in treatment and here as well. But after five years, no change in treatment. So uh, considering um, uh, this issue, is to be put in mind when we decide to have protocol biopsy after five years. However, protocol biopsy within a, the year of transplantation is important and valuable in refining the uh, transplantation follow-up. Regarding the, his, the histological BAMF 2017, you'll find the detailed description of BAMF within this videotape. One of the important aspects in transplantation is to educate patients, nurses, and our colleagues to stress upon drug adherence because drug adherence is associated with histology. So if the patient is not adherent to the treatment, you will find bad histological changes. And the coming issue of TJSN, you will find three articles speaking about the issue of adherence uh, within the, the renal replacement therapy. 
So adherence is very important and crucial because the most common cause of graft loss nowadays is chronic antibody mediated rejection. And one of the most important predictors of chronic antibody mediated rejection is drug non adherence. Regarding antibody, antibody mediated rejection was and remains. Uh, a silly and a poor prognostic factor in kidney transplantation. And th this is what was proven here. Uh, antibody mediated rejection implies a poor prognosis in kidney transplantation. And this is the videotape of antibody mediated rejection. Regarding the, uh, another important issue is the variability in the scoring of antibody mediated rejection between different pathologists. And this entailed that we should offer better training for pathologists to read the, uh, the biopsy without uh, this uh, variability. Plasmapheresis is an important stop in the management of antibody rejection uh, through removing antibodies from the serum, so getting rid of antibodies. But we need uh, them to be uh, supported by immune suppressive drugs to reduce the formation of antibodies. Another very exciting issue is the presence or absence of donor-specific antibody in the sera of the patients with the histological diagnosis of antibody mediated rejection. Uh, if you go and read the BAMF 2017 criteria of antibody mediated rejection, you'll find that either we, uh, the third criteria, either to have DSA in the sera or a surrogate marker from C4D deposition in tissues or uh, address, uh, studying the tissues with transcriptomic expression of antibody mediated classifier. However, this article it challenges this dogma because they found that the presence of uh, donor specific antibody, here this is the donor specific antibody, was associated with poorer. Uh, graft survival. So uh, both of them uh, have antibody mediated rejection. This line, this, this is a line of no DSA and this is a line of DSA. This means DSA is bad news. Further categorization into C4D positive or C4D negative. This two lines, two curves of uh, the presence of DSA, either C4D positive or negative, and here this is negative. So this means that the most important issue is the presence of DSA in uh, predicting graft outcome, and this is what was stressed on this editorial comment, is we should consider the value of the presence of DSA in the CIRA plus C4D and other criteria to be confident in the diagnosis of antibody immediate rejection. How to treat and what are the strategies to offer kidney transplant to highly sensitized patients? We know that we can do desensitization to get rid of antibodies and to have a negative cross match and to proceed immediately for transplantation. However, I am occupied by the data of the United States that desensitization is, uh, is uh, of high price and half outcome. And uh, so I am totally convinced by bare donation exchange program and I hope that I find it very rapid in the in my country. Regarding dynamics of early post-operative plasma donor drived uh, uh, free circulating free DNA level in kidney transplantation this is a single center pilot study we can uh, consider a donor derived circulating free DNA as a biomarker. So, in early after transplantation, what happened? The level of uh, donor derived circulating DNA is significantly reduced. And if we have any rejection, you'll find here a peak of increasing of the level that is reduced later on. And this is what was presented on the uh, TTS. As you see in this in this uh, presentation, that the uh, that the detection of cell-free DNA can help in diagnosis of rejection. This is what I mean here. Before rejection, you will find donor drive DNA is increased to reduce those treatment. And here, with antibody rejection, it peaks and then reduced by efficient treatment. This is the, an article uh, discuss the issues of what's hot, what's new, 
uh, the report from the American Transplant Congress of this year. And uh, one of the uh, hot issues is using 2-CLI-Zumab, which is humanized monoclonal antibody against interleukin-6. And this, uh, according to the discussion here, it can find its way in coronic antibody rejection, and its use was associated with a favorable outcome, and also in, in, um, even in the presence of borderline infiltrate to uh, uh, improve the outcome. Another uh, armamentarium is uh, anti-CD40 uh, antibody that may help in treating the patient. So a lot, and a lot of issues uh, are uh, written within this manuscript. Regarding the biomarkers, uh, all, uh, up to this moment, the only well-proven proven biomarker is donor-specific antibody. However, you can find in this uh, study multiple biomarkers, but I have a concern regarding the use of biomarkers in practice. I think biomarkers are very interesting and exciting tools in research, and we are hoping and dreaming to find solid biomarker like troponin in cardiology, for example. However, uh, this is the multiple biomarkers means a lot of expense. And the second point is hey, when we use biomarker, because today you may have a stable graft, and tomorrow you may, you may have a, a, a graft with histological event. So up to this moment, the gold standard is graft biopsy, and the most suitable biomarker is uh, following DSA. What about the advances in DSA technology, either to determine the complement binding or not? So this is the technical challenges and the clinical re relevance of single engine beat C1Q, T3D testing, and IgG subclasses analysis of human leukocyte engine antibodies. I think this is the, how the test uh, was carried out, and the most important question, is it more relevant to be done in pre-transplant or post-transplant, or the value is there either pre-transplant or post-transplant? The answer is, based on this study here, pre-transplant, these 3D binding donor-specific anti-chill antibodies are not associated with increased risk of kidney graft failure. And this is the, how the study was carried out. And here, if there is no DSA, this is survival. And if there is DSA, this is the survival, irrespective to 3D binding. So 3D binding in the red color, the line, is not different from non-T3D fixing, so long as DSA is present. And this study shows that pre-test, pre-transplant detection of the capabilities of T3D fixing uh, capabilities of antibody doesn't matter in the transplant outcome. However, the using uh, C3D binding after transplantation uh, may be the uh, the answer. So, post transplant C3D binding is superior to pre transplant one. This is a very exciting study because it addressed the issue of uh, two point, two important points following DSA after treating antibody rejection. So we have the cases for whom antibody rejection was diagnosed. And at the time of diagnosis, we have histology and we have a DSA detection. And then detect uh, after three months of standard treatment of antibody mediated reaction by plasma, IVIG, and rituximab, both DSA and the histology protocol biopsy were carried out. And so we can categorize patients into C1Q negative uh, at the time of antibody immediate rejection, and C1Q is still negative after three months. C1Q was positive and it changed into negative, and C1Q was positive and remained positive after treating antibody immediate rejection, and C1Q negative that was changed into positive, and the um, here you can find the answer if C1Q remains or it changes toward the positive, the graft survival is drastically affected. And this is the smart algorithm, including the, uh, the GFR, so this clinical kidney function, plus histological 
the presence or absence of transplanted glomerulopathy and the complement binding. So if we have post anti post treatment of antibody mate rejection GFR above 33, and then we should ask ourselves about the C1Q binding and chill antibodies. If it is present, yes, five year survival is 50-69%, and if it is no, it is the, uh, the uh, 93%. So the best outcome, if the GFR is a little bit preserved above 33 and DSA disappeared or it is not of C1Q binding capabilities. If the GFR after treatment is less than 33 milli per minute and there is transplanted glomerulopathy in the tissue, Oh, and, as, uh, and here you can find the five-year graft survival is 33%. If there is no transplanted glomerulopathy and there is a C1Q binding, here it is 35%. But if there is no transplanted glomerulopathy and the symmetric GFR after treatment is low, less than 33, no transplanted glomerulopathy and no C1Q binding anti antibodies, the graft survival here after five years is 76%. So if we put the data from DSA, C1Q binding uh, at the time of antibody mate rejection and after treatment, plus histological uh, protocol biopsy after three months, this uh, will help us to predict five-year outcome of transplantation. Regarding hepatitis C, this is the issue of this month of American Journal of Transplantation, and within this article, even on the here on the cover, you'll find wait time relate uh, gambling and organ on organ transplant with hepatitis C. And this is one of the articles, clinical outcome hepatitis C treatment before and after kidney transplantation and its impact on time to transplant a multi-center study. If you look here, we have two strategies regarding treating hepatitis C, either to treat before transplantation or to treat after transplantation with the use of direct antiviral drug. Here, if we encourage this is the arm of treating hepatitis C after transplantation. If we adopt this policy, this will increase the rate of transplantation. So the question is, is it better to treat before or after? I think the compromise is if we can treat before transplantation without, in, uh, without prolonging the waiting list on transplantation for transplantation, I think this will be the most suitable issue is to treat before transplantation. But if it will put the recipient in a very long waiting uh, for transplantation, it's better to go ahead for renal transplantation so long as there is no uh, other uh, problems and to treat hepatitis C after transplantation by the, uh, the uh, appropriate direct antiviral drugs. And this is another article addresses cost effectiveness of hepatitis C from the donor. Uh, uh, so it says hepatitis C positive donor kidney transplantation for hepatitis C negative recipient with concomitant direct acting antiviral therapy. Very exciting issue. While in our center, we don't accept to have kidneys from hepatitis C uh, positive patients. Uh, another, this is the another issue regarding the nucleic acid testing uh, to say it is viremic or not viremic rather than positive or negative. Uh, hepatitis C virus infected kidney wait list patients to treat now or to treat later. I think my point of view is to treat earlier before transplantation unless this will delay the process of transplantation. We should transplant and treat later on. The impact of direct antiviral agents on liver and the kidney transplant cost and outcome. Another article, another article, transplantation of hepatitis C virus, antibody positive, nucleic acid test negative, donor kidneys to HCV negative patients, frequently results in seroconversion, but not hepatitis C virus viremia, but we are not convinced by this data up to this moment. And here, this is the KDU guidelines, October 2018, this month, uh, this is the release of the kidney guidelines, and this is the executive summary. And this is a special supplement of Kidney International, and this is one of the articles within the current issue of Kidney International. And here, this is the how do we decide 
for treating hepatitis C after transplantation. According to the GFR and according to the genotype, we can use the best drug. And here, this is the, the uh, KDU guidelines for management of hepatitis C infected patients before and after kidney transplantation. Guidelines recommend kidney transplantation as the best therapeutic option for patients with CKD stage 5, irrespective of presence of hepatitis C infection. 1A, recommendation based on uh, uh, good research. We su they suggested that all hepatitis C infected kidney transplant candidates be evaluated for severity of liver disease and the presence of portal hypertension uh, if indicated prior to acceptance for kidney transplantation. We don't transplant uh, isolated kidney transplantation for patients with evident portal hypertension or decompensated cirrhosis. We recommend he, that hepatitis C infected patients with compensated cirrhosis without portal hypertension undergo isolated kidney transplantation and recommend referring hepatitis C infected patients with the compensated cirrhosis for combined liver and kidney transplantation and differing hepatitis C treatment until after transplantation. Timing of HCV treatment in relation to kidney transplantation before versus after, as I discussed, should be based on donor type, living versus disease, with less times by donor type, central specific policies governing the use of kidneys from hepatitis C virus infected disease to donor, hepatitis C virus genotype, and severity of liver fibrosis. And this, uh, this is not graded. So they recommend that all hepatitis C virus infected patients who are candidate for kidney transplantation be considered for direct antiviral therapy either before or after transplantation. And they suggest that hepatitis C virus infected kidney transplantation candidates with a living kidney donor can be considered for treatment before or after transplantation according to hepatitis C virus genotype and anticipated timing of transplantation. And they suggest that if receiving a kidney from a hepatitis C positive donor improves the chances for transplantation, the hepatitis C virus nucleic acid test positive patient can undergo transplantation with an HCV positive kidney and be treated for hepatitis C virus infection after transplantation and we are uh, con considering uh, this and con concerning this is our center policy. We don't adopt this policy. Using of kidneys from hepatitis C virus infected donors, uh, they recommend that all kidney donors be screened for hepatitis C virus infection with both immune assay and nucleic acid testing, if nucleic acid testing is available. And they recommend that transplantation of kidneys from hepatitis C virus Nucleic acid test positive donors to be directed to recipients with positive nucleic acid testing. After the assessment of liver fibrosis, hepatitis C positive potential living kidney donors who don't have cirrhosis should undergo hepatitis C treatment before donation. They can be accepted for donation if they achieve sustained virologic response and remain otherwise eligible to be a donor. And we can do this, this is our policy, on an individual basis, such a mother or father giving kidney for uh, their kids. Use of maintenance immune suppressive regimen. The guidelines suggest that all conventional current induction and maintenance immune suppressive therapies can be used in hepatitis C virus infected kidney transplant recipients. Management of hepatitis C virus related complications in kidney transplant recipients, uh, they recommend that patients previously infected with hepatitis C who achieved sustained virologic response before transplantation be tested by nucleic acid testing three months after transplantation or if liver dysfunction occurs. Untreated hepatitis C virus, positive kidney transplant recipients should have the same liver disease follow-up as hepatitis C positive non-transplant kidneys. Hepatitis C virus infected kidney transplant recipients should be tested at least every six months for proteinuria. And they suggested that 
patients who develop new onset proteinuria, either urine protein to create a ratio above one gram per gram, uh, or 24 hour urine protein above one gram on two or more occasions, have an allograft biopsy with immune fluorescence and electron microscopy included in the analysis. And they recommend treating treatment with direct viral, antiviral agent regimen in patients with post transplant hepatitis C associated glomerulonephritis. Regarding medical complications after transplantation, this is one of the uh, publications regarding CMEV virus, third international consensus guidelines. I advocate everyone to read, to know uh, the policies of prophylaxis or preemptive therapy uh, regarding CMEV using the how to uh, how they stratify the risk. And the highest risk is donor positive to recipient negative, and uh, the moderate risk the, uh, the recipient is positive. And if donor negative and the recipient negative, the risk is uh, low. And here, this is a table that shows the use of the uh, drugs like uh, intravenous ganciclovir in relation to uh, creating clearance in treatment dose and maintenance uh, uh, preventive dose. Valgansaclovir, if, if, if we use Valgansaclovir and the, submitted, the GFR creating clearance of 60 milli per minute, the dose, the standard dose is 900 milligram every 12 hour, and the maintenance is uh, 900 milligram. This for treatment and for prevention is 900 milligram once daily. And it was reduced the creatine clearance. We'll find here reduction in the dose of uh, valgansaclovir. And this regarding valgansaclovir. So the, I, I recommend all of you to read this uh, guidelines. Regarding the issue of treating or not asymptomatic bacteriuria in kidney transplantation, uh, there uh, last year. There was a randomized control trial that showed no value of treating asymptomatic bacteriuria in kidney transplant recipient, and the editor commented just to say to just to say no for the use of antibiotics. And this was very challenging to the old dogma that asymptomatic bacteriuria in transplant patient deserves treatment to avoid immune stimulations and the chronic rejection later on. However, I think this letter to the editor is very wise. Asymptomatic bacteria in kidney transplant recipients, there is the, uh, the, the, we can treat by antibiotics in the early first eight weeks. Later on, there is no need to use antibiotic in asymptomatic bacteria to avoid resistant strains and to avoid the, side, the, the, the problems of antibiotics. Regarding the BK virus nephropathy, here this is a very nice uh, kidney case conference, how I treat, and here I'm ju uh, just delivering questions and, and, and answers. What is the percentage of viremia and nephropathy? Viremia, BK viremia after transplantation is around 20%, and nephropathy is around 2%. Which is the best screening test for BK virus? It is BCR in the serum. What is the rationale of decreasing tacrolimus? Because tacrolimus reduces the immunity against BK, T cell against BK. How should immune suppressive be handled, handled after resolution of BK nephropathy? There is some uh, di difference uh, in management of uh, immune suppression, but the most important issue is to follow the uh, uh, BCR in the serum to know where we are going. And I recommend all of you to read the details of immune suppression handling. And one of the exciting question, if we have graft loss due to BK nephropathy, can we transplant this patient again? So can patients with graft loss due to BK nephropathy be retransplanted? The answer, yes, provided that after we, show, we are sure that BCR for BK is negative after three time reading. And this is the algorithm. You can go monitoring viremia. And so the monitor uh, for BK viremia by quantitative plasma BCR. 
percentile protocol at regular interval after kidney transplantation. And usually the intensity of PK virus occurs within the first year. So this is the protocol of follow-up within the first year of the, after transplantation. And we may uh, uh, request the PK uh, virus screening after uh, within the event after that if they, if we have a patient who is Graft's function. But protocol just surveillance the, during the uh, one month, three months, six months, and one year, and then according to the graft function. So we either have viremia detected on a screening with a stable kidney function, or viremia detected on routine screening with a change in kidney function. If it occurs here with a stable kidney function, decrease immune suppressive drugs. Low immunologic risk, discontinue mycophenolic acid at the third brain, High immunologic risk and viremia uh, here, uh, mycophenolic, reduce mycophenolic acid uh, at the cerebrain, continue low dose steroid if not on a steroid free regimen. And here, the decrease immune suppression if you have viremia detected on routine screening with a change in kidney function, and here the, uh, the biopsy is needed. And either we are here. And the uh, uh, viremia decreased, we should monitor the patient plasma BK viremia PCR every two to four weeks. And then if viremia not decreasing uh, at uh, uh, this time after eight weeks, look at serum creatine. Serum creatine is stable or decreased. Serum creatine increased. Here we can follow the algorithm. Here, viremia not decreasing, serum creatine is stable or decreasing, reduce uh, trough concentration of uh, calcium inhibitors by 25 to 50%, as you see here in this uh, cartoon. If uh, the serum creatine increased, do biopsy. If there is no rejection, reduce the calcium inhibitor. If there is acute rejection, consider a steroid pulse IVIG and avoid uh, ATG. Consider increase in maintenance immune suppressive drug. If there is acute antibody based rejection, a treat with IVIG plasma pharesis. Consider increase in maintenance immune suppressive drug and to monitor viremia and again and again to monitor the immune suppression and to go talent uh, how to deal with VK and this is BK and this is the algorithm in one slide. This is another, uh, another case. Uh, for a patient who presents with fever and gross hematuria in kidney transplant recipient. This is the ultrasound shown thickened urethelium, and this is the Papa Nicola stain and the immunohistochemical stain showing adenovirus infection. And this is how adenovirus uh, is uh, diagnosed. So this is the BCR, uh, here viral titer, and here this is the comments. And you can, you can fix this slide and read it in details. And here, if the there is the uh, we can treat with sidofovir, and the my question to you: What are the adverse effects and how to avoid them? The most common uh, side effects are nephrotoxicity because you can find after sidofovir Fanconi-like presentation and ocular toxicity. And the how to avoid is to uh, offer hydration. Regarding malignancy after transplantation, this is one of the important review about post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease. Uh, as you see in key points, the key points in this uh, review, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder is the most common non-skin cancer among the solid organ transplantation. A new classification has recently been proposed. The use of antiviral prophylaxis doesn't affect the incidence of BTLD, regardless of the antiviral agent use, response to rituximab seems to be a good prognostic factor. And this is the, the a very interesting uh, article about malignancy after transplantation. If you look here to the different regions, Australia, Canada, Finland, Hong Kong, Sweden, UK, USA, uh, all sites will find the higher incidence of malignancy in comparison to general population. So uh, here, we should be cautious, and this is the, regarding the old sites, and this is regarding individual cancer. So cancer is more common in transplant in comparison to general population. And these are recommendations uh, for cancer surveillance in, in transplant recipient. For breast, annual or biannual mammogram for all women 
after the age of 50 years. Women between 40 and 49 could undergo screening. Colorectal uh, malignancy, annual uh, uh, occult blood in stool, uh, fecal occult blood in stool, and uh, a five-year flexible sigmoidoscopy for an individual about 50 years. For cervical, annual cytological cervical uh, cancer screening and pelvic examination. For prostate, annual digital rectal exam and the BSA. For those uh, who are above 50 years, hepatocytic alpha fetoprotein ultrasound every six months in high risk individual. A skin monthly self examination, total body scan examination every six to 12 months by expert physician or dermatologist. Renal. No firm recommendation. Some suggest regular ultrasonography of the native kidneys. Regarding the use of checkpoint inhibitors, this is one of them, which is abilumumab uh, for treatment of advanced melanoma. Uh, we have many uh, checkpoint inhibitors now, FDA approved for treating malignancies like melanoma, non small cell lung cancer, uh, and other uh, malignancies, and this is the report of six cases. And uh, although if you, if you read them, you'll find uh, one patient uh, got the benefit. However, the, the uh, problem that we are afraid of checkpoint inhibitors, they work through stimulating immunity. So this may be complicated by acute rejection. Regarding the FMF, all of us are aware by colchicine, but this is the, the letter to the editor showed that we can use anti-interleukin-1 therapy for treating uh, the, uh, five, here this is a case series of five patients treated with anti-interleukin-1 therapy uh, for treating FMF, familial Mediterranean fever. So this is alternative management that we can think if we have the patients with no control by colchicine. Treatment of transplant patient is not only immune suppressive drugs, but we should be holistic. Uh, we should take care of the proper diet. And uh, this is DASH, diet approach to stop hypertension, and it's a application in renal transplantation, as you see, and the risk of renal function decline and all cause mortality in renal transplant recipient. So they calculated the score of, of uh, DASH diet. And here, the higher the score of DASH, the lower the adjusted hazard ratio for renal function decline and the lower the all cost mortality. So DASH diets are valuable to the patient, to transplant patients. And these are the components of DASH diet fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, low fat dairy products. So if you have the higher the, uh, the, the, this compartment, the higher this component, the higher the score. And here sodium, uh, read the processed meat and this, the uh, higher of this, the lower the score of DASH. So this is how we calculate the score and at the end of the day, the higher the score, the better the outcome. How to treat hypertension? This is the, the, this is the, this is a slide shows post-transplant hypertension. We should think of other concomitant conditions. If we have transplant patient with post-transplant hypertension and heart failure, Think of using diuretic as inhibitors, ARBs, beta blocker, and other drugs like hydrazine or spironolactone. Associated arrhythmias of coronary heart disease, beta blocker is a preferred therapy. Associated proteinuria is inhibitors or ARBs, hydrochlorothiazide, spironolactone. Uh, 81 receptor antibodies induce hypertension using uh, Lucertan. Gut microbiota dysbiosis and the, the, the disturbance of gut microbiome. Uh, this, uh, the, this is a very interesting and exciting issue in the kid, CKD, dialysis, and transplantation. And here, this is the may explain diarrhea in kidney transplant recipients. Regarding the vascular necrosis, the question is Is it more common with tacrolimus or cyclosporin? The answer is cyclosporin, because cyclosporin has direct effect on bones. Which gender, uh, male or female, you can find here. This is the uh, vascular necrosis, and this is cyclosporin. It is higher with cyclosporin, higher with male. So male and the cyclosporin are associated with higher risk of a vascular necrosis. Which side? If it occurs unilateral, it occurs 
within the same side of graft. Why? Because it may be it may be explained by steel phenomena, but if it occurs in both sides, it may be as be a reflection of immune suppression drugs. Cell therapy. All of us are aware with T regulatory cells for diagnosis as diagnostic purposes, and T cell is known by CD4, CD25, and FOXCB3. Uh, and here, this is a nice review. Regulatory T cell therapy is a promising therapeutic strategy for inducing transplant tolerance, modifying it direct to express customized receptors that allow for the redirection of these cells toward designated engines, enhances the efficacy of this therapeutic approach. Novel cell culture and gene modification techniques can be employed to improve uh, the stability, homing, and survival of TRIG in vivo, Third-party TRIG are a new approach to develop more standardized clinical trials and increase the acceptability, the accessibility of this cell therapy product. And you can find here, this is the new and the technique using chimeric angina receptor or universal chimeric receptors. So this is one of the advances. Another article addressing the same. Here, it is not only CD25, CD4, and uh, uh, CD4, CD25, and uh, FOXCB3, but here you can find all pluses are referring to additional markers defining TRX cell. And here you can find the clinical trials. Here, the, this is the list of trials of using clinical trial related to TRX and kidney transplantation that are ongoing. So it seems that we are near from using TRX cell. Is it only TRX cell, or we have other uh, types of regulatory cells. We have here regulatory B cells. So the uh, here, uh, PIRIG, this is another name. And we have here dendritic cell uh, regulatory cells, profiling, targeting, and therapeutic applications. And this is the rationale uh, is, applied, is discussed here. Another issue is using donor apoptotic cells for promoting transplantation tolerance because apoptotic cell therapies uh, secretes mediators of take me policy and here this is the how the game is and how donor apoptotic cell help in the issue of uh, enhancing T-Rex cell and T-cell energy T-cell depletion to promote uh, tolerance. All these issues can be read in details within the articles, but this is just a tour in cell therapies. Regarding kidney donor corner, this is a question. How long is too long in preparing live donor for uh, to have a, a kidney from a live kidney donor? According to this article and the editorial comment, if the kidney donation from a living kidney donor takes more than six months, it is considered too long. Regarding estimated GFR, according to this commentary, estimated GFR is less reliable than measured GFR, so there is a limitation for the estimated GFR in deciding kidney donation. Hyperfiltration, we have either tensile stress or uh, flow shear stress, and each one of them has special pathophysiology. So decreasing glomerular number, and this is the the two sides of either shear stress or tensile stress. At the end of the day, we should think of hyperfiltration mediated injury uh, in donation and how to get rid of them. Both the donation hypertension incidence predictors and correlates are discussed in this article. As you see here, the risk factors for post-donation hypertension is the same like general population, increasing age, old age, first degree relatives, uh, percent, family history of hypertension. This is the uh, higher body mass index, the uh, lower estimated GFR, uh, so you, the same higher uh, glycemia, And these are the same risk factors. This means that we should uh, aggressive modify other risk factors after kidney donation to avoid weight gain and to ensure uh, following healthy lifestyles because uh, poor healthy lifestyles and development of hypertension, especially if it's associated with comorbidities, will be associated with increased 
problems and this is the color cause if the patient if the donor has no risk one risk two risk or three risk the higher the risk here the uh, the hazard issue for, for hypertension increases significantly regarding some uh, miscellaneous miscellaneous issues regarding bilirubin what are the uh, this this is a very exciting title bilirubin a new therapeutic for kidney transplant because bilirubin is one of the defensive mechanism against oxidative stress this is why when we find uh, a person within general population who has very low level of bilirubin we are expecting excessive oxidative stress in these patients and cardiovascular disease in comparison to the, the persons with uh, with the normal bilirubin and not uh, in the high normal and not low because bilirubin reduces inflammation reduces oxidant load increases renal perfusion and it's considered biomarker for uh, 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 if it is reduced biomarker for transplant rejection and it so bilirubin is uh, associated with a good outcome this is the normal physiological bilirubin or high normal bilirubin and indirect bilirubin and this is the link of bilirubin with immunity so it seems that it has immune mediatory effect on these cost stimulatory molecules and others estimated gfr this is one of the article addresses the many formulas in the elderly and they discuss the merit of each formula. It seems that fast uh, formula is suitable. Uh, regarding the use of bariatric surgery in solid transplant patients, if we have post-transplant, uh, post-renal transplantation, morbid obesity, how can we deal with the patients? I am totally convinced by bariatric surgery in this issue. And this study is assuring for the absorption after uh, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, for example. This is tacrolimus percentage of the chromos blood trough level values uh, failing with the uh, falling within the therapeutic range it seems that is here it is not affected as uh, the before and after surgery when we adopt a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy and this is the complicate these are complications of obesity so type 2 diabetes here the color here if there is uh, the improvement if we improve the obesity and this is a complete remission, and this is uncontrolled diabetes. So here, this is type two diabetes. Uh, this is uh, 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 this is all patients treated with a bypass or laparoscopic uh, uh, sleeve gastrectomy. Here you can find a fraction of complete remission and a big fraction of improvement, and it's the same regression, remission, and improvement. For this is regarding type 2 diabetes, regarding hypertension, uh, a complete remission, complete remission, complete and improvement. Dyslipidemia, either complete remission or improvement. So it seems that bariatric surgery is very beneficial when there, there are comorbidities and uh, we have a uh, uh, huge body mass index. Regarding the loop diuretics, this is a very interesting issue because this study shows that renal transplant recipients receiving loop diuretic therapy have increased a urinary tract infection rate and altered the medullary macrophage polarization marker of expression. So they address the markers for the uh, this is diuretic use and this is the ratio of HLDR and uh, CD. And so the, 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 uh, they confirm it that the uh, ratio of M1 to M2 is reduced significantly with subsequent increased UTI. However, in this transplant review, loop diuretics may be beneficial, but the evidence is, uh, is poor. Regarding the SHROM rock, here we have SHROMs within the glomeruli. Uh, this, uh, this structure on the glomerulus uh, stabilizes nephrin and regulate nephrin but within the tubal interstitial it is it increases by process so if we understand all these uh, basic uh, uh, components in a basic research we can uh, have new innovations in treatment to target the beneficial compartment to st stabilize and to antagonize the pore and the inappropriate um, uh, arm so the this is my all my slides regarding the update of the this month in transplantation and i presented some of them 
within this valuable CME course uh, run by the Mansoura Erosion Nephrology uh, uh, Mansoura Erosion Nephrology Center team, uh, led by Professor Adel Bakr and Professor Samir Sully, and the uh, here we have all these uh, invited speakers from all universities. And so I would like to uh, congratulate and appreciate the efforts of Professor Adel Bakr and his enthusiasm to have this CME course as an annual course. And here the message is we advocate learning and education. And I am very proud by the si this site with this a huge amount of lectures and videos. And uh, if you go to YouTube, you'll find uh, some of 2018 updates in transplantation diabetes and transplantation, both transplant diabetes, renal ogress function, and the key message is uh, we should keep learning because we are living through learning. Thank you very much for your uh, attention, and I'll be happy if you have any question to send me through my email. Thank you. Goodbye.